the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All four Gospels tell us of Jesus gathering his first disciples. The list of the twelve disciples or apostles is not identical across all four Gospels, but the number twelve is symbolic of the twelve tribes of Israel. We know from the Gospels that some were fishermen, but there is also a tax collector, and none of them seem to have special qualifications. It is a coalition of the willing. Today's Gospel shows us how Jesus calls. Jesus doesn't just wait and hope that people will follow him. Jesus issues a specific invitation to each disciple. Follow me or hear, come and see, come with me. Sometimes in the Gospels, the invitation will come through a healing, a revelation of a new future, full of potential and possibility. Sometimes the invitation from Jesus is a challenge. Sell what you own, then come, follow me. You remember the story of the rich young ruler and that not everyone says yes at least not the first time. What Jesus offers each potential disciple is an epiphany, a revelation of possibility, and then there is a moment of decision, of choice. Come and see. This is the early evangelical invitation from Jesus' own lips. You may have noticed on various parish materials this year that the parish leadership team chose come and see as a ministry theme, especially as we regather after the pandemic. We are in a new season of refreshing and invitation. In today's gospel, we learn that Simon and Andrew were disciples of John the Baptist before they were disciples of Jesus. John the Baptist is, in fact, though, a disciple of Jesus from the beginning. Even before Jesus appears, he looks for the one who is to come. He prepares the way for the one who is to come. The religious leaders wonder if perhaps John is the Messiah. All the people coming out from Jerusalem wonder if John is the one. But John always, not just once, but always, points away from himself to Jesus. He is clear about who he points to, about who must increase. He has a huge following. And yet, two chapters later, John summarizes his relationship with Jesus in one sentence. He must increase, and I must decrease. John's words, I think, are the life of discipleship in one sentence. Christ must increase in me and in the world and I must decrease. Each of us is called to make more and more room for the light of Christ to increase in us and shine through us. The truth is that God has given us, the church, to shine as the revelation of Christ in the world today. We are the epiphany, the manifestation, the footprints of Jesus in the world today. Jesus is the light of all people, but each one of us can be a light to someone else. We never know when God makes us that epiphany, that revelation of Jesus, that invitation for someone else. We remember that Andrew simply goes and brings his brother Simon to Jesus. He simply goes and finds someone he loves and says, come and see, just as Jesus has done. If we think of people who have changed our lives, it may have seemed random accident that we even met them, but such meetings become for us holy ground, divine appointments, providential. Of all those who have mentored me, I think of my preeminent mentor, 
whom I met in what turned out to be the last year of his life at 58. Mike Bloy changed my life radically just by being himself. I know Mike didn't once think to himself, in the fall of 1983, I'm going to change the life of a 20-year-old exchange student on this campus for good. But he did. I was searching, and he pointed to Christ in a way that I could recognize in this human being next to me. He was an epiphany for me. I could see in Mike that you could be a Christian and have an intellectual life and a love for the arts and have all kinds of abiding questions. Mike had jumped the stepping stones across the river into the church, into identifying with people on a faith journey. And I thought if he did that, I can jump that river too. This is what come and see means, to give others courage, to encourage by exploring questions of faith with them, coming alongside, creating a safe space for conversations about Jesus and being disciples together. Not go and see, I'll stay here, I'll watch, but come with me, join me. Mike said, don't worry about still having questions. Faith has little to do with still having questions. Faith is commitment and questions, he said. The next step will unfold as you are walking the path. Finally, to my 20-year-old self, faith that makes sense and opens into discovery that sheds light on a new future that doesn't close off anything but opens up new possibility. That is the adventure of faith. And I saw that embodied in a real, live human being on the path with me. Here's my question. If we don't invite others to come and see, what is stopping us? What is so large in us that we hold back? What needs to decrease in us, in John the Baptist's words, what needs to decrease in us so that Jesus may increase, so there is more room for the light of Jesus to shine through us? Is it fear of not having enough faith, enough answers to share with others? Is it shame over our imperfections, as though we couldn't possibly be a credible witness? But what more credible witness can there be to Jesus than a fellow flawed human being, as we all are? Perhaps we think that only some people, religious professionals, academics, clergy, theologians, are qualified to say, come and see. However, there are people whom you will talk to and encounter who may never set foot inside a church or think of talking with a religious professional or a clergy person. It may be you that is in their path, you who will be the credible witness, you whom they trust, you in whom they can see the gospel, Christ alive in a life. Perhaps what holds us back is fear of being that person, that embarrassing Christian. How might our desire to share Jesus need to increase and our reluctance to invite others to come and see decrease? Evelyn Underhill, the English Anglo-Catholic mystic of the 20th century, Evelyn Underhill says, the church is in the world to save the world. The church is in the world to save the world. We may think the church is not doing a very good job, but we don't know how much worse the world would be if the church had not been in it for the last 2,000 years. The church is in the world to save the world. I invite us to reflect on that this week. This is not about us. It's about Jesus and it's the world Jesus loves. If we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus enough, it can override our self-consciousness 
and our reluctance to step forward, our fears of failure, our dis-ease with saying, come and see. Jesus is about the only one who can do that, in my experience, who can override our self-consciousness about sharing our faith with one other person. When we keep our eyes on Jesus, we don't worry about ourselves so much, about how we're going over, about failure, or impossible hopes, or looking naive or idealistic. We keep going day by day with other faithful disciples of Jesus, and before we know it, that which looked uncertain or impossible has come to pass. At least that has been my experience, not all the time, but enough of the time. All of us on the leadership team here at St. Luke's have been through immense challenges and achievements on this block over the last 17 years. And on the surface, it's about real estate, financial sustainability, and mature governance. But underneath all that, it's really about Jesus. It's about mission. It's about St. Luke's being a force for good and a force for God in this city. Our achievements as people of faith are for Jesus and by Jesus' strength. It is Jesus who encourages us to jump the river into the community of faith. We pass it on. Finally, we didn't find our way here this Sunday morning by accident. It is by divine providence that we are here. We are here to touch and receive God's own life we behold the Lamb of God today in the Eucharist. God's life enters our human bodies to renew us for nothing less than our part in saving the world. In the name of the one holy and living God, amen. <laughs>